ओम कंडमंडलाकारचराचर तत्पम दर्शिदेन तस्म श्री गुरव नम अज्ञानतिरान से जनान जनम शलाद चक्षुर्मृत येन तस्म श्री गुरव नम गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुदेव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात परम ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरे नम so now today kriya is coming okay tomorrow no worry we need to have some kind of a background before we go into the action practices so today we are now going to look at the same thing that we discussed in the morning but in a different way a different angle of looking at what we said um we always you know we we say that we are rational human beings and so when we discuss we say oh i have my own rational framework uh, i don't i would allow that to move this way or that way and we are just going to look both of us what this rational framework means is it really quite rational or is there a doubt about it because what we are going to study and understand is sometimes beyond our ordinary logic so we need to look at this carefully now when i say that <laughs> i have formed a conclusion about something this is the rational framework which i have created Now, what are the inputs with which I create this? What are the inputs? What is the data based on which we create our so-called rational framework, image? Now, how do we see the world? How do we? Uh, what is our contact with the world around us? past experience but before the past experience now if i want to contact the world what do i use i use my senses i have my eyes i see i am i i hear um i smell sometimes things may look very nice but you go near terrible smell i uh taste and i touch i mean these are the only five instruments of perception with which i know the world right yes or no is there any other instrument that i have that we have no maybe we have but at the moment we don't now using these five senses we look at an object and say this is what it is okay my question is the the data that we derive or the inputs that we get from these five senses how reliable are they how reliable are they it is a very simple matter um i see something in a particular shape or let's say simple matter i see the sunrise and the sunset every day almost every day but a uh, young man sitting here who's probably going to school will tell you that he has been taught in school that the sun neither rises nor sets it's the earth that is moon okay but what do we see with our eyes one of our important instruments of perception we see the sun rise and we see the sun set but the sun neither rises nor sets okay that's one part of the story look at we'll examine the eye again one of the important objects instruments of perception 
you know how it is. We think that we take intellectual discussion um, decisions, but it's generally based on the five senses. I buy a car, I buy a car because I like the shape, the size, the color. And then I have my own argument to say why it is the best. Human beings, we live by our senses. This is how we get to know the world. Now, if you, if I look at an object like this, watch. Which incidentally is made in 1969, still working. If I look at an object like this, or a simpler object like this, not going to disappear, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Now, I say that this has a particular shape. Why? Why do I say it has a particular shape? Because that's how I see it. Why do I see it in this particular shape? Because my eyes, since my birth, from my birth, my eyes, your eyes, they've all been built in a certain way, with a convex lens of a certain strength. It's built in a certain way. Therefore, my instrument of perception, the eye, since from birth, it's built in a certain way for all of us, generally. I see this in the shape. What if I was born with or there is some other creature whose eyes are built in a different way with a different kind of lens, maybe a concave lens instead of a convex lens? Yeah, speculation, of course. Or a thicker concave lens or an irregular lens. What would be the shape of this cup? Actually, there are such beings. The common house fly has compound eyes. You know that. How would the house fly see this glass, this cup, as with its compound eyes? It may see many little, little cups put together. I don't know how. I have to get into the head of the house fly to see how it sees this cup. What I'm trying to say is that the shape and many other things of an object are based on our instruments of perception by the data provided, by the inputs provided by our instruments of perception, which are generally only five in number. If that is the case, what is the real shape of this glass, of this cup? I see it one way. I often think, how would an elephant actually see us? We don't know, because it looks a little scared of us. And we are so small, maybe it's up to, this thing has to be worked out, we have to figure out. I haven't gone and examined the eyes of the elephant. But I think it is built in such a way that it probably sees us like giants or something. Otherwise we are just puny things, one shot and we are dead. But then it's so... All I'm trying to say is the framework on which we form our images of this world are based on the inputs. And the inputs can vary according to the instrument of perception and therefore we really don't know what it is. It is, of course, because I can't drink water from it. It is. But what it is, we really don't know. Although we are so utterly sure that we know. Because it's very comparative, depends on our instruments of perception. It's like we, we wear colored glasses, or sunshades, and you see everything in a different color. What if I'm born with an eye like that? You would say, this is white, and I would say, no, it's yellow. Therefore, how much can we trust? 
the images we form of the world that we live in. You know, the famous poet many years ago, Alexander Pope, said something very interesting. He said, the difference is <coughs> as great between the optic seen as the object seen. Now this is the same with all the senses. In the one of the ancient texts on Sankhya, Sankhya Pravanchana Sutra, this beautiful uh, work, a beautiful experiment on how things are not what they see. They start by taking a, a cube of a particular color and a particular shape and then trying to figure out what are the intrinsic characteristics of this block that we have in front of us. Suppose you have a red cube, red colored cube. So that's the first distinguishing mark of that cube, red. Now the argument there is, color is a quality of light, of the sunlight, let's say, or artificial light. And we think the red color belongs to the cube. The cube, it so happens, has the capacity or has the attribute of reflecting absorbing all the colors in the spectrum except the red, which it reflects. Therefore, it's called red. So the question asked is, is red really the color? Is a quality or an attribute of the cube or is it an attribute of light? You know that white light, what we call, is a combination is of the spectrum. In school we have these experiments. As a disc with different vibgeor colors, you know what is vibgeor? Violet, indigo, blue, green, red, etc. And you, 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 uh, what do you call it? Rotate it in a particular speed and you see only white because, and you pass white light through a prism and it comes out in a spectrum. So, one attribute of the red cube which we were utterly sure is its quality is gone. Well, it, for some reason it's molecularly so built that it reflects only certain color and absorbs the rest. Suppose it absorbed all the colors, it would be black. Suppose it reflected all the colors, it would be white. So the color is not the attribute of the cube. Okay? Then, but you would say it still has a shape of a cube. Why is it in the shape of a cube? What did we discuss just now? How will it look to a house fly, to a common house fly? It may look like an oval. We don't know. Or something else. Okay? But you say, but it's still there. It's, it's material. It's it has weight, yes. What is weight? Weight is the quality of gravity. Oh, but there is mass, yes, there is mass. It's hard. Hard for who? For me. For a big creature like an elephant, it's not hard. It can break it in one second. Then size. Is size really absolute or relative? For me, this is small, this is glass, not so small, but anyway, small. But if I turn it upside down, which if I do now, the whole place will get wet. Let me drink the water. Yeah, it's a small cup, paper cup. Think of an ant who wants to climb and come to the other side. 
how does the cup appear to the ant? It's a little hill which it has to slowly and laboriously climb and come on its side. We think we have established that it is a small cup. Well, not for the ant. It's a big thing. That material, mass. See this cloth? I can't put my fingers through it. Thousands of viruses and bacteria can go through this as if they're entering through the gateway of India. Yeah, for me it's, uh, it's not penetratable. Think of a tiny little creature. It can go through this easily. So is it really big or small or spacious? Or what is the space relationship that we have with this cloth? It's very relative. Now, <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say, all I'm trying to say is the only thing that we know about this world is the image produced by our sense organs, processed by the brain or mind, if you want to call it, and put it in front of us. That's all we know about this world. Actually, what it is, we don't know. And it may differ according to the preceptor, right? Not preceptor, perceptor. Okay. At one time, we were dead sure that material or matter is solid. The smallest brick of this matter that has built this whole world is considered to be the atom and it had a core and it had an electron so on and so forth. Newtonian physics. Then we entered the era of quantum physics when the scientists were dead sure that they were unsure of everything. <laughs> Seriously. One time everything was known, everything was solid. The smallest brick of matter, the unit of matter, cannot be seen by the eye. You cannot even see it with an electron microscope. People sometimes think with an electron microscope you can see. No, you can't. It's too small for that. How do you know it exists? How do we know that these smallest units called quarks? How do, how do we know? By the reactions. In a strong magnetic field, electromagnetic feel something reacts in a certain way and we say, ha, huh, this is the quark, this is the quantum particle. Now, wait a minute, I can't even say quantum particle. Because it is the experience of the quantum physicist that if I think it's a quantum particle and watch its reaction, it suddenly behaves like a wave. So I conclude, oh, it's a wave and I'm looking and it's acting like a particle. And a group of scientists went to the extent of saying that it probably depends on the observer. So who is more important, the observer or the observed? Or what is more important? Because when you watch, if a particle becomes a wave, and when you watch, the wave becomes a particle, is it acting according to us watching it? Well, some great physicists like David Pohm went to the extent of saying it all depends on the observer. It's not fully accepted yet, they're still working on that. But this is sure, that the uncertainty principle, which is the highest principle of quantum physics today, which explains the unit the ultimate reduced unit of matter is called the principle of probability or the principle of uncertainty, which means nobody knows if it is a particle or it's a wave. So from complete surety, from complete certainty, in the ultimate analysis we have come to complete uncertainty. 
we have also come to this understanding even through physical science. If the physical scientists are ready to admit it, that this entire universe is built of something which is completely uncertain, but the observer is important. Without the observer, you don't know whether it's a particle or a wave, or both, or one at the same time. So, therefore, now we'll come to the mind. This is the physical matter. Now, we, human beings with our minds, evolved minds, how do we communicate with each other? Do we really communicate with each other? This is a very serious question. Do we really communicate? You have formed an opinion about me, reading my autobiography, looking at the YouTube. You have formed an opinion. Seeing you for this today, till now, or knowing you before, I have formed an opinion about you, an idea about you. So when I say I'm communicating, I'm not, we are not communicating. The image you have of me and the image I have of you are communicating. We are not communicating. So what kind of real communication is this? when the images are communicating. I said all this to figure out, to make uh, you understand that these matters are very relative. There is no absolute certainty in any one of them, but there is absolute certainty that there is a witness seeing all this, or experiencing all whole idea of Vedanta, the whole idea of the search is to find the witnessing entity separated from the conditioned witnessing entity to the absolute unconditioned entity, witnessing entity. Now that witness is a word in Sanskrit for that sakshi, the witness, even in the court. When a witness is called, in Hindi they say calls a Sakshi, Sakshi Kopala, who has witnessed. Because there is no other proof other than the witness. We are saying that witness is our consciousness in its pure, subtle, real, original form. And when that is touched, you realize that there are no many witnesses there is only one witness. There is no separate witnesses. It appears to be separate because it is witnessing through this set of instruments. You eliminate all the instruments and there is only the witness. And this witness is not subjective. Why? Because it contributes to the objective. So it is actually quite objective. So how does the human being touch that? First, <laughs> I thought you didn't like what I was saying. What did 
that thing. Just before. Huh? Huh? Did somebody say sex? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry. What? Sakshi. Hmm? One witness. One witness. Good. Nice. This is called a dialogue. <laughs> okay. We will put it this way. Vedanta says um, that the question of how to put it in words. Okay. According to Vedanta, the expression used to describe the ultimate reality, the supreme being, whatever, which the limited mind cannot conceive of. So you must make it unlimited, conceive of. It's called Satchidananda. Word used in Sanskrit is Satchidananda. Now, Satchidananda is not one word. It is one word, but it is made up of three syllables. There is Sat, there is Chit, and there is Ananda. Ananda everybody knows, right? Happiness, bliss, opposite of grief and pain, Ananda. The first part, Sat and Chit. Now Sat is the word which means that which is real or that which is not temporary which is always there, as opposed to that which is not real, which is asat, and which is temporary. It's not, it's here today and gone tomorrow. So, sat is the opposite of that. That which is always is, this is very interesting, Plato said something very interesting. It's not Advaita, but it's a little bit Dvaita, but he said, there are two things in this universe. One is, capital I, is, and is never becoming. And the other is not, but is ever becoming. So the mind is actually that which is not, but is ever becoming. When the becoming ceases, there is only that which is. You know how the mind is? It's always becoming. Ah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm poor, I need to get rich. I'm rich, I need to become poor. There are such serious. You want to become a sannyasi, you want to give up your wealth. I want to become poor. I am poor, I want to become rich. I am small, I want to become big. See this? So this movement of wanting to become, when the becoming ceases in the mind, then there is only, what is left is only that which is, which is not becoming anything. And that is Sat, the reality. And Sat, is that which is real, therefore it can't be any of the objects we describe because they don't seem to be, they are relative, they are not absolute. It has to be absolute. And it has to be there all the time, which is not the case. M is here today, after a few years, yeah, there is no M, except maybe in your minds, if you last longer than M. Hmm. Your mind. So, Sat is that which is different from all this, which always is. It doesn't become anything. It has no desire to become anything else. And fortunately, that is our true reality. We are that. This is what Vedanta says when it says, Tat Pamasi, you are not this, but you are that. This meaning the limited individual, that meaning the unlimited Sat. Now, the second word Chit means 
it's not um, an immaterial thing. It's conscious. Chit means conscious. It's it's a conscious reality, not an unconscious uh, physical thing. Like, of course, this also has movement, but not a self-recognizing consciousness. You think it doesn't move, it also moves. There's nothing on earth that does not move. Inside it, if you look, you see a lot of movement inside. Because it contains atoms, definitely the electrons are moving. And that movement is itself the destruction of the thing. Slowly, slowly it disintegrates. This is movement. Life is movement. Time is movement. Can you imagine? If there was no change, how would you reckon time? Time is change. No. And chit is the essence of this, which is the consciousness, pure consciousness. And the quality of this consciousness is pure bliss. It's not bliss derived from anything. In fact, Vedanta says when you derive bliss or happiness from anything, you're merely bringing out you're merely manifesting a small part of the ananda of the Supreme Reality. You think it's coming from the outside object? It's actually the outside object just ignites the capacity to manifest that happiness from inside outside. I'm eating an apple, for instance. Not the one that Eve gave to Adam, but normal apple. And I enjoy the apple. Now, is the enjoyment happening in the apple or in me? In me. So, I'm the enjoyer. And it is the enjoyer who is happiness. Not the material object. So, therefore, chit means consciousness. Something that is conscious, not an unconscious thing. And the quality, the attribute it has, is bliss, ananda. What kind of ananda? Not the small happinesses that we usually have. We can have, you are allowed to have that and there is nothing wrong with that. But to understand that this happiness is that which is unending. Agamas describe that happiness as anandam manandam brahma. That ananda that has no anta, no end. How wonderful. It's all part of you and me. You don't have to be dependent on anything but this, which is your own self, which is Anand. Now we have discussed all this, but in between we forgot to uh, look at time. Time. You know, time is so relative. We like to think of it as absolute, but it's not absolute. Suppose the satsang that's going on was terribly boring. Suppose, I hope not. If it is, then I would look at my watch every now and then. It's going on and on. When is it going to end? Suppose it's interesting. I would listen and then I look at, oh my God, it's already five o'clock. While the watch shows one time, the mind is the most important aspect of time. If you like something, the time seems to be running very fast. If you don't like something, the time seems to be running very slow. Although the watch, hands would show you the same time, reckon from the watch. Also. Think of, we think that we have a long life, certain number of years, and we will live for so many years and we die. And we look at the mosquito and say, oh, the mosquito lives only for two days or three days, I don't know. You have to ask the mosquito experts, we don't know who they are. But it's a very short lifespan. We think it's a very short lifespan. 
But in this what we call a short lifespan, because we compare it with our lifespan, the mosquito has lived a hundred years because it has grown from a larva, it has become a mosquito, it has married, I mean whatever it does, and, <laughs> and it has kids, I mean it lays eggs, mm. and it has sucked the bloods of everybody, from Einstein to the ordinary man. So, the mosquito actually has led a long life. From our reckoning, it's a short two-day life, but not for the mosquito. Time, therefore, is very relative. Although, if you reckon by the clock, it looks the same. But there is a lot of psychological factor involved in it. According to the Bhagavad Purana, the creation happens when Brahma breathes out. When he breathes in, it's all finished. Or, the time of Brahma compared to the time in this world is like the batting of an eyelid. When batting of an eyelid, there are four manvantaras happening. We think they are long. But if you go to the core of your consciousness and touch the essence of your consciousness, you realize that everything is just a snap. Snap of the finger. So the good news that we all have that essence with us. If you remove the distractions and becomings that happen around, finally you touch this. There is a, we discussed the uh, Mandukya in the morning, not fully of course, but generally. There's another Upanishad called Isha Vasya Upanishad. Again, not very long. It's beautiful. It says in the beginning, Isha Vasya Medam Sarvam. Yatkincha Jagatyam Jagat. That means that supreme reality pervades everything here. There is no place where it is not. Ishavas, idam sarvam, not after death, no, idam, here, pervades everything. And then the next sentence, etkincha jagatyam jagat, it pervades everything that moves. In fact, the word jagat in Sanskrit, which we use for the world, for the universe, jagat. The root of jagat is jagatyam, that which moves. So there's nothing that does not move. Time moves, we move. World moves, cosmos moves, everything is in constant motion. Which is why it's called Jagat. Now, this supreme reality pervades everything here. Everything moves. But do you know that there is something called the eye of the cyclone? The dead center of a cyclone, there is no movement. There's only a vacuum. Everything else is moved, and it is into this vacuum that everything is sucked in. So that center of this entire movement is the essence of your being. Everything else is moved. Etkincha jagatyam tena tyaktena bhunjita ma grita kasya siddhanam. So therefore it says, if you want to understand the Isha, which is all pervading, let go and rejoice. We have been taught from childhood, gather and rejoice. Upanishad says, let go and rejoice. It's the opposite. When you say let go and rejoice, it's not give up and rejoice. Let go. May I give you an example of how you can rejoice even after the worst experience in life, you're always brooding about it. Suppose, <coughs> 20 years ago, Manish Bhai has given me a slap. And it was a hard slap, let's say. Hmm? 
How long did the shaft, does the slab last actually? How long does it? Five minutes or oh, ten minutes? It was very hard, I might have lost a tooth, so a few, few days. But after that, the slab doesn't exist. As an actual fact, it does not exist. But will I let it go? No. Place like a tape inside my head. Oh, he slapped me, he slapped me. You didn't tell, I'm sorry, I'm just using a name. He slapped me, he slapped me. It becomes a festering wound. I'm not able to free myself of it. It's there in my head, but actually there is no slap. It's finished. It's gone. I won't let it go. Twenty years later, I want to slap him back. He might have even died, this guy who slapped me. But it's in. Can we let go of it? The moment you let go, you rejoice, I'm telling you. It's this sitting here in the head that's eating up the whole thing like a virus. Can we get rid of it? How? Every night we go to sleep. I hope so, all of us. Except my Sornath Babaji. Every night we go to sleep. And when we sleep, you know why we get up in the morning and brush our teeth and all that? Because sleep is like a short death. If you don't brush your teeth, you'll smell like a dead body. Every day we are a dead body for a short while. When we sleep, therefore, can we say to ourselves, okay, this is finished. And when we get up in the morning the next day, can we say, this is a fresh new day. This is sadhana. Sadhana is not merely sitting there. No? You learn Kriya Kriyakot. Sadhana is living uh, every day as a new day, letting go of yesterday so that you are not carrying a festering wound in your head. This is the meaning of the Upanishad, the Ishavashi Upanishad, which says, Tena Dhyak Tena Bunjita, let go and rejoice. So, it's a psychological technique for you to get in touch with the inner reality which is the essence of the whole moving universe, the Isha, the Supreme Being. Now, <coughs> um, this is what we are going to study. So what has that got to do with the practice like Kriya will be breathing in our time? So we have to look at it in a slightly different way. Just as I said, when the mind is quiet and calm and absolutely free, then we touch essence. This is exactly what Patanjali means. When, you know that Patanjali's Yoga Sutras came a little later, but the yogic texts are already there in the Yoga Upanishads from the time of the Yajurveda. Now when Patanjali says, defines yoga, if you read the Yoga Sutras, which is the standard text on the practice of yoga, what Patanjali says is, yogas chitta vritti nirodha, which means yoga is the nirodha of the vrittis, oh that's not English, uh, means yoga the removal of all the disturbances and contradictions, all the distractions of the mind. This is yoga. Why so? Because when all the distractions of the mind are clean and the mind becomes like a clean mirror, in that quietness and calmness of mind, is reflected the true self, which in yogic terminology is called a purusha. Now purusha doesn't mean a male here. Purusha means pure consciousness, 
is revealed when the mind is free of all its distractions, all its disturbances and has settled down. This settling down of the mind is the tarmac from which you can take off to the higher levels of existence. But this is essential. Therefore, all the different yogas, Atta Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Kriya Yoga, Kriya Yoga is part of yoga, of course. All these Jnana Yoga, all these if, take effect only when all distractions of the mind have settled down. You may approach it through the intellect, you may approach it through practice, you may approach it through devotion. There are different ways of going because human beings are different. Some are more emotional, some are more intellectual, some are more yogic who like to sit down and practice. So there are different kinds of people. So depending on that, the paths can be different, but they move towards the same goal. And what is the goal? Complete freedom of the mind from all distractions. A total settling down of the mind with no disturbances, no opposites clashing with each other. When this happens in that quietness, one discovers one's true self, which is IS and is not becoming. So this is the whole process. So how does that process, how is this process connected to a practice for Chitta Vritti Nirodha? The whole practice is described, yogic practice is meant for bringing about the cleaning up and the quietening of the mind and freeing it from all distractions. Now, um, how is it connected to breathing? Why do we have to learn certain breathing exercises? Let me first explain in a simple way and then we will get into a little more complicated understanding of this. The simple thing is, the breath is closely linked to the mindset, to the mind state. When you are very agitated, very agitated about something, have you watched your breath? You should, when you are very agitated, you are very angry, uh, you feel like throwing the glass down and break something. In that state, just turn around and look at how your breath is functioning. You'll be surprised. Your breath would be very erratic. <clears throat> Heart breathing, very erratic. On the other hand, watch your breath when you're calm. When you're listening to beautiful music or seeing something which you really love to see, or just going for a walk in the lawn, hmm? not, not particularly doing anything, or exerting yourself, quietly close your eyes and watch your breath. Be very slow. So one of the simple connections between the breath and the mind is that the calmer the breath, the calmer the mind, more agitated the breath, the more agitated the mind. So therefore, the yogis handle the mind through the breath by ways and means of calming the rhythm of the breath. When the rhythm of the breath becomes calm, the mind becomes calm. But it's temporary, it will come back again. But through practice it becomes a permanent affair. This is the simple connection between breath, pranayam, and your mind state. There is much more to it, which is the prana that operates in the body, the channels through which it operates, and how you can control the movement of it through specific channels and bring about quietness of mind. One thing to note before we stop this session right now, when the mind is calm, without distractions, it has tremendous energy. The 
loss of energy that we feel is because the mind is not quiet, not because it is not agitated. The corollary to this is that creatures that breathe less live longer, creatures that breathe fast live shorter lives. It might be an incentive for it to shorten your, make your breath calmer, right? At least, if not spiritual. How many times in a, in a second or a minute does a mosquito or a frog breathe very fast? Compared to us. Compared to us, how many times in a minute does an elephant breathe? Much less. And a whale? Have you seen whales? Anybody? Whales. The great whales. The whales are not fish. They are mammals. They are not fish. They don't have gills. They cannot breathe the water uh, in the... Uh, they can't breathe in water. Every time they have to breathe, they have to come up to the surface and breathe because they're mammals. And if you look at them, every 50 days or so, you'll see a whale coming up to exhale. And how do you know? Because there's a spout of water coming. And you know the whale is breathing. Then it breathes and goes down. 15 days, no need to breathe. How long does a whale live? More than a hundred years. How long does a cockroach live? It breathes maybe one hundred times a minute, a few days. Sometimes I wonder if the cockroaches die at all. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're gone, they're gone and they come slowly creeping. Anyway, so <clears throat> the rate of breathing the length of your life are also interconnected. The calmer you breathe, the longer you live. If that life is a good life, of course. Uh, yeah, so we come back now, take up the rest. <laughs>